Welcome to the Addiction Connection podcast, connecting the hope of the gospel with the heart of addiction. I'm your co-host, Mark Shaw, joined via Zoom with Jim Quigley. Hi, Jim. Hello, Mark. <laughs> I think you're I think you're the, the host, and then I'm then I'm kind of a co-host guest for something. So Yeah. Today you're kind of a guest. I thought our topic today we could go instead of kind of focusing on the news and current events, which is always uh, depressing, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, I thought we'd talk about our union with Christ and how that applies to the addicted. And I know you wrote a paper on John 15, mm. kind of about this very thing, did you not? I did. Um <laughs> And uh, it was probably one of my more embarrassing moments in seminary so far. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was my first uh, Bible class at uh, RTS, taking the core Bible courses. And it was with the with the president of RTS Charlotte, uh, Dr. Michael Kruger. And uh, I was reading Jeremy Pierre's book at the time for another class. Um, uh, I think it's called the dynamic heart. Is that what it's yeah, called? That's right. And, and uh, just really loved that book. And just talking about um, the, uh, uh, the uh, volitional part of the heart, the effective part of the heart and the, um, um, the emotive or emotional part of your, of your heart. Um, I think I got those right. Maybe wrong off the top of my head, but anyway. Um, and I looked at, uh, I was reading John 15 and I had this idea about focusing on what it means to abide in Christ, which is kind of what you're yeah. talking about union with Christ. And right. so I went to Dr. Kruger and I said, Hey, I'm thinking about writing about the word abide, how it's used in, in the new Testament, especially in, in uh, John 15. And he looked kind of in the air, real skeptical, like, and like, yeah, I think you could probably, probably do something like that. If you, and, you know, he's singing like a scholar, like a New Testament scholar that he is. And <laughs> right. that I was going to do this word study on abide. And, well, what I ended up doing was I ended up writing a biblical counseling paper on how John 15 speaks to the three functions of our heart um, uh, under Jeremy's definition of all that stuff. And I got the paper back and Dr. Kruger said, hey, this is a really great effort, but you didn't follow the assignment one bit. <laughs> So. <laughs> oh man that hurts <laughs> yeah so you didn't write a like an academic paper for my class which is what you wrote this like counseling paper but uh but anyway <laughs> i still got a i still got an a minus in the class so that's good i think i got an a minus in the class so that is good yeah, yeah. well he knew you you uh <laughs> you did your best i'm sure it was yeah. good yeah. This wasn't what he was looking for from an academic perspective. It's, right. Yeah. Right. Well, John 15, verse 4 through 11 says, Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. This mm -hmm. is Jesus talking, of course. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Mm. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples." I got to read, keep going. Two, three more verses. Verse nine, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. <sighs> That's just yeah. tough, isn't it? It really is. It really is. And when you said that you wanted to talk about unity with Christ and how that is related to the addicted, um, you know, just all kinds of thoughts. I mean, we might go 
I might really go on some rabbit trails in this one, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, you know, I was just at a meeting before this podcast and we were going around, I was with other believers and we were, we were going around, um, the, the, the circle. And, uh, um, one of the questions we were answering was, what is your, what is your most fundamental belief in God? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, very interesting that, um, uh, you popped this topic on me because, uh, I explained to the guys that, um, uh, and while our audience here may not know my full story uh, as far as my struggle with substance abuse personally, but I, I struggled for, uh, I was in active addiction from 13 to 24. And then um, from 24 to 30, I was in secular recovery, but also in very conservative uh, Christian denomination um, and learning lots of really great theology and doctrine. But but in my experience, I had two worlds going on. I had the secular world of recovery, and then I had this world of great uh, doctrine and, and theology and teaching, and they were, they were separate. And the way they worked in my mind um, really built up a really bad pride. Because, and this is, this is what I mean. Like, when I was with the, my Christian friends, I figured they really didn't know much about really struggling with life like we do over here in this group, you know, um, these, these people that have, have done these steps and have pulled themselves up out of the mire and whatnot. And then when I was over in that group talking about pulling myself up out of the mire, uh, I would hear about all these false religions and false gods and this really strange hotbed of, you know, mysticism really is what my experience was in the uh, 12 step rooms. And I would basically be arrogant. Like, you know, these people may be sober and talking about spiritual things, but they don't know the true God. And like I do, and uh, even ones that did, they didn't have good doctrine like me. So this was going on in my head. I'm not saying this is everybody's experience, but all that to say uh, when, when people would ask me after multiple years, of sobriety, they would say, Jim, how do we know you're never going to relapse again? How do you know that you'll never go back into that world? I used to tell people that, you know, I've spent lots of time thinking about it and I cannot, I cannot be unconvinced that when Jesus, when I die, I need Jesus um, as my savior. I need him to save me when I die. Um, and I was convinced of that beyond a shadow of a doubt. And, uh, I used to tell people that is my answer. Now, the other part of my story is I relapsed for five years and, um, and now I'm um, 12 years. I haven't had a substance or abused a substance, um, uh, for 12 years now. And I've been at freedom farm and, you know, people ask me a lot, uh, the same question a lot there you know, how do you, how do you know you'll never go back to that? Now, once I was convinced before that I needed Jesus when, when I died, what am I convinced of now? And I'm convinced that I need Jesus every moment of my day, which was something that took a long time to learn. And, and this is what this passage really, you know, brings home to me, uh, John 15 and what you're talking about, our, our unity in Christ. I mean, to the point that it is such a important thing to believe for me it's really the starting point of all the troubles in my life when i am having any struggle in life um it's usually because i am not living as such that i am fully dependent upon god and i'm basically trying to depend upon my own self in some way shape or form right and that's usually knowing that that it's totally true. I'm totally dependent on him, but it's also totally true. I fight that with every ounce of my being like all the time really helps, helps me make sense of my life on a daily basis as far as my needs and, and how I can experience true growth. Yeah. That whole concept of abiding in Christ and you can do nothing apart from me. And, you know, he's, he's the, um, 
he's the vine, we are the branches. And so, um, yeah, I just think about with addiction, I mean, you, you, you hit on it so well. You were sober for those six years, but sober and self-righteous and not abiding in Christ abundantly. I mean, you're saved and, you know, all that, but you, you didn't function that way. You know, yeah. and I think the union with Christ thought I, I had for this was like when we function knowing we're united with Christ, it, it looks very different in our lives than it does when we function in self-righteousness. And we all do it in some ways or, you know, are tempted to do it anyway, to mm. live as though we're not connected to the vine. We're just doing our own thing. And, um, you know, with, with, uh, addiction issues, I just, um, just taught a seminary class and loved meeting with those guys. And bottom line at the end, I just said, you know, guys, the world supersizes this, uh, this issue makes it bigger than life and almost bigger than Christ. And we have to say, you know, addiction issues are just another heart issue, another sinful thing that ends up ensnaring you. It ends up grabbing you. Absolutely. But, but you can uh, have hope and be free <clears throat> and abide in Christ and be united to Christ. Um, and so I, you know, it's kind of funny because I do addiction counseling. I do addiction speaking and teaching you do too. And I don't want to make it a supersized issue, but it, there are some distinctives and some things about it that I think are helpful when you're counseling the addicted to, to help the, with their hearts. Um, but yeah, I don't, you know, I'm almost undoing my whole message. Like I'm teaching in two conferences in July and I'm going to get up and say, addiction isn't this a major issue that's supersized. We all need to be helping and we all need to be doing it, you know, and yet then I refer to Freedom Farm, you know, for, for help uh, or, you know, um, and, and there's, so there's that aspect of it, but um, I love what you guys do because you're tell, telling people you need to be connected to Christ and abide in Christ. And uh, what do you tell the guys when they're struggling um and you're trying to help them to abide in Christ. It's so usually, it's usually evident to you more than it is to them. I'm sure. Yeah. You know, it, this is where a lot of, you know, you have to be very gentle in admonishing people and you have to, like you said, you can see it, but you know, one of the biggest struggles I, I believe that exists in addiction ministry for me is that you can see what their problem is right in front of you and you and you wish you could just kind of verbally argument argue them into you know either salvation or sanctification um but they have to they have to be led there by the holy spirit and convicted by him and they have to exercise their faith in god's truth on their own i can't do that for people but uh, one of the things that I do find myself doing a lot when it comes to abiding is you have to you have to uh, know how to listen to how a person is is um, experiencing their circumstances and then responding to their circumstances. Mm. And many, many times, probably nine out of ten times, they are doing it through a lens of not abiding in Christ, and you have to be able to just very specifically point out how they're doing that, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, it's very interesting, uh, um, you know, just in your basic rules here, hey, um, uh, get up, uh, uh, make your bed, clean up, um, do your devotion. Um, you know, when these guys come in and they start having real problems, you know, and we, we say, well, are you doing these things you're supposed to be doing? And they say, well, no, I'm not. I'm not doing those things. And you ask them why. And then they'll give you this big litany of excuses on why um, they don't need to do these things. Right. And you have to be able to say, well, do you realize that ultimately underneath all of that, the reason why you've convinced yourself that you don't need to do those things is because you know better. 
Mm. You know better. Mm. And then you have to say, did you come here because you could not figure out how to live life and you had, you know, you were in this bondage? Yes, I did. So what are you telling me with your actions in your life right now? You're basically telling me you don't need me to tell you anything because you got this thing figured out. I said, man, that's a scary place to be for everybody. Yeah. And, uh, you know, <laughs> we, we, we usually get into a conversation about their need for Christ and all things to, to, to be unified in Christ and to abide in him, all those things. But uh, we don't get there usually until we point out how they're not doing those things. And, you know, you become a real good practitioner being able to show that to people, <laughs> I think, through real good experience of examining your own life and how you're not doing those things. Um, right. You know, I had, a, I had a, a Bible study I was in last week that I go to on Mondays, and uh, we were talking about persecution, the persecuted church. We're, 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 we're talking a lot about our, our, our home church here is going through Revelation, which is I've actually never really spent a lot of time in Revelation um, just because of how controversial it usually is. But um, I really appreciate what we're going through. Um, and we were talking about the church in Smyrna being uh, spoke about in chapter two and how they were facing lots of persecution and they were being they were being uh, commended for for their uh, for for doing well in persecution. And uh, the conversation led to, you know, are we are how has our faith been tested in persecution? And you come out and, you know, and been gr and grown on the on the outside and uh, on the other side of it. And everybody was talking about these big events that happened to them, you know, like, you know, I uh, I had a business and, you know, we didn't know where the next next uh, check was going to come from. And, you know, we, we really trust in God and, you know, something happened or, you know, some real bad sickness in the family. And we had to do it. And those are all fantastic things. But. We were we were asking ourselves that question: Would you be ready to face the persecution? Like, um, you know, a few years ago, there was that video of all those guys. Um, I forgot what country they were in in the Middle East, but they were lined up on the beach. You got you remember that all blindfolded? And uh, oh yeah, remember that? Oh, they beheaded them. Beheaded yeah. them, and 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 what were they doing that whole time? They were singing hymns, right? They were singing hymns, and they were and so like. When we think about persecution over here in America, we always think like in that moment, would I be the guy singing hymns or what or you know, what would happen? And, yeah. you know, we're, we talk about these major things that we go through. But, I, you know, I got to thinking about, you know, most people in the Bible that's, that well, all people that faced severe persecution, they they were given lots of little tests of learning how to abide in, in Christ leading up to big things it makes sense yeah so like today i mean i i know uh that my my family my wife and my children are probably the 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 the, the place where i learn the most of when i'm not abiding in christ <laughs> yeah. because man i am a selfish person and and you know i'm very turned into myself and when you have young children that want your attention when you have a wife that needs your support and attention and when you got all that going on yeah. man you could you want to talk about and so i mean i have to learn to abide my in christ to to love my wife uh, uh the way I, I should and to be yeah. a good father to my children and and you know i don't know what that's preparing my 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 life with but you know the point was is that you're never going to be able to be trusted with these big events like these guys, these martyrs, you know, that, that were beheaded singing hymns until you, until you can, you can say, Hey, you know what? Um, I have a lot of victory on the little things, you know? Right. And, um, and, uh, so when it comes to abiding, it's the little things for me right now, uh, where I, where I see how much I, I need to grow. That makes sense. Yeah. The, um, I think about the, there are really only two ways for the Christian to live. The unbeliever, there's one way to live, but for Christians, there's two. And it's Galatians 5, 16 and following. But I say, walk by the Spirit, 
and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For, so right there we see you're either going to walk by the Spirit or you're going to gratify the desires of your flesh. And that's revealed in our relationships when we're, you know, gratifying the desires of our flesh, just wanting comfort or wanting, uh, you know, uh, control of something or whatever it may be. Absolutely. Um, and, and in those relationships, like you referenced, that's that's where God reveals that. And so walking the, by the Spirit produces, this passage goes on to say, it produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. In such things, there is no law because you're loving other people. You're, you're being uh, selfless. Right. And so um, union with Christ also means producing fruit by the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, in your relationships, so that you're a blessing to them. I mean, it, the fruit of the Spirit blesses me for sure. I love that to experience love, joy, peace, you know, et cetera. But I also want that to pour through me to be a blessing to you and to others and to right. people that you love. Um, now, we're talking about union with Christ it's not a biblical phrase, this union with Christ, um, but it is a biblical construct. So you don't find the union with Christ, union in Christ in the Bible um, as a phrase, but it's all in the Bible when you think about it in this way. Now, here's some of them. I've been researching this, so I thought I'd share this with you. In the Old Testament, the covenant bond with Israel and God, uh, in Psalm 73, 26, it says, My flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And then God reciprocates with Israel as his portion, Deuteronomy 32, 9. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. And so it kind of goes both ways. God's our portion. We're, you know, we're his portion, or in this case, the Old Testament, the people of God, Israel. Um, similar concept today. And then one of the God's names is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so when you think about that as applied to addiction, uh, what kind of comes to mind in terms of the, the covenant bond and, uh, and this relationship with God where he's our portion? And, and of course, that's talking Old Testament, but uh, this similar idea today in the New Testament. We'll get to New Testament language in a minute. Okay. Well, uh, the first thing that hits me and come to mind is just – the way I view every case, counsel, the, every person that comes in front of me, and this goes not just the addict, but um, everybody that comes to you, if you're listening to this and you're wanting to help somebody in a biblical way, um, but kind of want to speak into what you were saying uh, that you want to do some uh, lectures on about how people make addiction this special thing, right? Right. So, so like someone comes in front of you, and um, they may need that covenant with God uh, initially. They don't. They don't have. They don't have that covenant relationship with God, and they may need it. And um, uh, this is where I think it speaks specifically into the to the addicted. Um, a lot of people will argue that, well, I know they need to be saved, but we need to we need to cure their addiction first. And then maybe they'll be more open under quotation marks mm. um, for for God, right? And I think that I think that um, uh, yeah, you can provide some physical relief from somebody, like a place like Freedom Farm, where they're safe and they're they're being fed and they're they're in a safe place where they can maybe start getting some rest and all that stuff. But that cannot over prioritize their absolute need for um, that covenant relationship with God um, to be, un to, to understand um, that, that uh, we are his and, and that he is ours. If they don't, yes. if they don't get there, then you can, you can give them all the felt needs mm. ministry as possible, yes. but, but you're, you're, they're never going to be transformed. If that makes, if that makes sense. But yeah. then um, if somebody can clearly articulate that they are in that um, that covenant relationship with God, um, kind of going back to what I was just saying, uh, sanctification um, essentially is 
when they live lives in such a way they're trying to deny that, right? Yeah. I, I am a believer, but I'm going to I'm going to live for me and I'm going to make idols of these things which I think I need in order to be the person that I want to be. And that's all I, there's a whole bunch of I, you know, and there's no, you know, uh, uh, there's no he in any of that. Mm. And, and again, that back to that, we are his and he is ours. You, you, you have to be constantly pointed back to that um, um, in uh, trying to uh, disciple somebody that is a regenerate believer um, because they usually lack uh, significantly and even understanding that. Yeah, boy, that's good. And there's a corporate sense of union with Christ um, as well as the individual sense. But yeah, if a guy in your program doesn't get the union with Christ part of this, you can do all that you, you know, all the teaching, all the reading, all the, but he's not going to grow and, and really get, um, get what he needs. Now yeah. here's some New Testament language in Christ, you know, and that's, that's tons of places belong to Christ. Christ is in you, in the Lord. Then the profound mystery of the marriage union that pictures Christ and his church. So that's more of a corporate union um, and then vine and the branches we mentioned in John uh, 15. Uh, let's see, head and the body metaphor of union, 1 Corinthians 12, union of the Holy Trinity. So the, the Trinity are united, but each one is, is different, a different expression, uh, but they're united. And uh, in the spirit and the spirit in you are phrases you see in the Bible. And then, uh, yeah, I mean the uh, the abiding stuff. So, um, when I when I think about all those words and all those phrases and this this union of Christ, what I love to 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 realize is that union with Christ is unbreakable. It's it's enduring even after death. Romans eight thirty eight and thirty nine says, "For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers." nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Mm. And so what we do in uh, counseling every day, whether it's addicted people or, or quote-unquote regular people, which I'm trying not to supersize that issue, right? We're all, we're all addicted in some ways. We're all regular, but, you know, this isn't any big deal, but we're trying to lead people to have a relationship with Jesus Christ that is something that can never be stripped away, not by man. And I don't believe God takes that away either. Once you're truly born again, you, mm. you don't lose it. And so that inseparable connection to Christ, and, and you can't separate out obedience. So you can't say, well, I'm, I'm connected to Christ, but I'm going to live uh, in a in a willfully disobedient and unrighteous way, because the the Bible's replete with uh, tying obedience and righteousness and righteous uh, actions to um, being this this united with Christ concept that we're talking about. So um, so you can't really separate that out as well. Um, but those are just wonderful truths, and that's kind of what I wanted to pick your brain about today and be on a positive uh, rather than some of the, the negatives with addiction counseling. The great thing is you get to do that. You're not in a program with government money where they're telling you, you can't say that you can't do this. You get to share this kind of hope, the hope of the yeah. gospel with the addicted. And I love that you can do that. You know, in the, and what you're just, I love being able to do it too. And um, it's funny, those a lot of those terms you know, in the Lord, in Christ, it, it's when when that when that shift happened in my own um, mind, when my mind was renewed about my dependency, back to what I was saying, I, I'm I know I need Christ every moment of the day, whether I live like that or not. Those words popped off the New Testament letters like crazy. The, mm -hmm. They're they're everywhere. They okay? are. And <laughs> And I like to make the point using using um, using a very very 
like if you if you barely grew up even just around Christianity, there's a there's a there's a a, a real easy teaching lesson to make this point. I, I always ask people to turn to Galatians, uh, I mean Ephesians six, and I say, what does that say? The first verse it says, "Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right." And you know what they you know what most people do? They say it says. Children obey your parents, right? Yeah. And I was like, I was like, yeah, it absolutely says obey your parents. And so, so let me let me tell you something. So when I screw up, and my my uh, parents say, hey, the Bible says to children obey your parents, and you're not doing that right now, and you're in trouble. Or if I say that to my own child, children obey your. You, the Bible says children obey your parents, and you're not doing that right now. You're you're in trouble. Let me. Let me discipline you. Um, haven't I left something huge out of that very, very sentence right there in verse one? Because it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. It doesn't just say obey your parents. In the but Lord. we never hear the in the Lord part, and we never take the time to explain what why that even exists there. So if you just basically tell people, and that's just one simple command from scripture that gets easily misrepresented a lot right yeah. i mean how you know you know when i discipline my children how how tempting it is that i just want to tell them they're to listen to me because i'm their parent and they need to just do what i say and i and i totally miss an, an opportunity to tell them their need for jesus for their sin and for their obedience which is why in the Lord exists right there. We we don't obey the we don't obey our parents out of out of pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps and forcing our our obedience. Can can you obey can you obey God's commands on your own strength and power, Mark? Not at all. No, but you know, even in a simple little passage like that, you leave you leave out three words in the Lord. Yes. Why is it there? It's everywhere. It's everywhere in the New Testament. And that's the thing. Um, is the Bible full of commands that we are to obey? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But it's also full of, of how we do that. And it's never, you do it on your own strength and power. It's always in the Lord, in Christ, with him, in him, all of that. So it's very interesting. Yeah. Well, it's... It's just a good refreshing topic and uh, addiction counseling can be so challenging just because you're dealing with the flesh or the spirit, um, but usually the flesh uh, when people are giving you a hard time. And, uh, and I love that uh, we can, we can help people. We can walk with them. We can disciple them. We can, help them to be connected to Christ. That's why we call this the addiction connection. It's really all about union with Christ. And that's not in the Bible, that, that particular phrase, those three words, union with Christ. But we are united with Christ, and we've shown all the language. Like you said, it's everywhere. The in Christ, in the Spirit, in the Lord, you know, all these phrases are in there to point to union with, with Christ. And uh it's, it's just such a refreshing topic and a, and a great thing to think about for the addicted person who can repent of sin and get connected and united with Christ today and forever, and they won't lose it. You can't lose it. What a great concept. So, well, thanks, Jim. You are a blessing, sir. And we I will hope, end. I hope CJ doesn't make fun of my salute. I didn't do the yeah. awkward hand. I just saluted. You did the salute. Yeah. Well, he probably won't watch this. Um, <laughs> well, we, we miss him today, but we'll see him another time. And I thank you for being here today. And I want to tell our, our watchers and our listeners, thanks for supporting us. We are excited about the summit. It's coming up. Registration should open soon. So, uh, Get your tickets now for uh, that event in November and a lot of exciting announcements ahead. So uh, thanks for joining us today. Take care and God bless. God bless.